Nothing in my life has opened more doors or given me more opportunities than generosity and philanthropy. Nobody thinks they're a salesperson, but everybody's a salesperson. And we negotiate all of the time. Money is just a tool, but most of us have a relationship with money. The way wealthy people build wealth or the way that you change your mindset is that you create stewardship for your money. When you become a leader of people in a business or whatever it is, your job is to first of all, know what everybody in your world, what they want their world to look like. Hey everyone, welcome to Flow Over Fear. I am so glad you're here today. My guest today is somebody that I've been looking forward to meeting for uh, quite a while now. Uh, His name is Aaron West, and he is an entrepreneur. He's a business owner. He's a real estate professional who has closed over $120 million in real estate sales. And uh, more than that, he is just a He's a community member. He's a giver. And uh, and this was a really, really great interview. I know Aaron through a group uh, that we're both in called GoBundance. And he's been a member for a very long time, long before I was, I, I was in it. Um, and I've always looked up to him in the group uh, because he you could tell that he's a giver. You could tell that he is creating value. You could just tell that he is doing a lot of great things in the world. He lives an abundant life. And uh, in GoBundance, he... he co-hosts the 728 show, which is an exclusive show uh, uh, that is for GoBundance members alone, uh, that highlights the stories of entrepreneurs who have gone from seven-figure net worth to eight figures, nine figures, 10 figures even in some cases. They've interviewed Richard Branson. Uh, and it's just an incredible show to be a fly on the wall to this to this show and worth the pro- price of admission uh, to go abundance. Um, and uh, uh, in this interview, we talked a lot about uh, where Aaron came from, his, his start when he started working with his father at an early age in the family business to striking out on his own and seeing his first taste of money working at a jewelry store and uh, that evolving into his real estate career where he redefined his relationship with money and uh, and his entry into GoBundance where, um, where he became something of the accountability person, the, the person who knew how to set the right kind of goals. And that's now what he does. He, he actually delivers masterclasses within uh, GoBundance and elsewhere on how to set really, really great goals, goals that stick, goals that lead to a longer term vision. And this interview, we had essentially a masterclass on how to set great goals. So please, please enjoy this far-reaching interview that I've had with Aaron West. Aaron West, ladies and gentlemen. Aaron, I am so, so happy. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much for being here. It is my pleasure. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I feel I we were talking offline and we practically did uh, the interview before the interview. So, <laughs> we did. so I, I was really excited. I was mentioning that, uh, you know, I feel like I know you because uh, uh, we're, we're both members of GoBundance, which is a men's mastermind uh, group um, uh, in the uh, end. Um, and you, even though you're not one of the uh, founders of it, to me, you seem like an elder in the group, somebody who's been there a long time, who's who's a staple in the group. I've always looked up to you, even though I haven't really met you or had, had a lot of time to spend with you. So I'm really excited to dig in here um, and uh, love to learn a little bit more about you and where you came from. Where'd you grow up? How did you uh, uh, come to be the Aaron West that is sitting before me today? <laughs> the Aaron West. It always scares me when somebody says that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm the oldest of six kids. I grew up poor. Uh, didn't even realize that I was poor until much, much later in life, you know, was very happy. Mom was very loving. Dad was a disciplinarian. We grew up very religious and uh, but poor. You know, I didn't realize that having a kerosene heater in your living room wasn't normal mm-hmm. for people in the winter. Or, you know, we had people babysit us and they would buy me and my three brothers new pairs of shoes because the shoes that we had were just all jacked up. And in hindsight, it's it's amazing how many things we file away that we don't even think about, but are very impactful for our lives. Yeah. And, you know, that that was one of them. So I, yeah, high school, no real college. I had too many friends that had degrees that were waiting tables. And I knew that mm-hmm. wasn't really my skill set. It was more people and, and sales. And so I um, 
didn't do that. Had had some jobs. Got uh, was going to be engaged to a woman uh, in '95, I guess, and uh, didn't work out because I couldn't be the man that I knew she needed me to be. So I, I broke it off. But I had been working for my father up to that point uh, in his family business. And if anybody's ever worked for a family business, you know that that's the last person that gets paid is family. Oh, and, yeah. and when I was going to get married, I was like, I need to get a real job. So I went to work and got uh, uh, two jobs. I, I applied for a couple of jobs, one at UPS loading trucks in the morning and then one at a jewelry store. And I got calls from both of them accepting me the same day. And so I said, all right, let's do it. So for three years, I would get up at three o'clock in the morning and work UPS loading trucks and then come home, change my clothes, put on a suit and go go work at the jewelry store doing doing sales. So I went three years with really Christmas, Thanksgiving, and 4th of July as, as days off. And the rest of the time I was working either one job or the other. Wow. Moved down here where I am now in Modesto in 97 uh, with the jewelry store and, and was with them for till 2005. I had a really successful career with them. I was the top salesman for a 16, 16 chain you know, jewelry company for the last five years. And then I woke up one day and I was like really entitled hmm. and just felt like there was nothing left for me to do or nothing left for me to achieve with this company. And my father-in-law who has been in real estate since the eighties, um, we were talking about flipping a property cause this was Oh five and we were going to buy a new house. And then when it was built, sell it. And he said, don't do that. He goes, if you're going to do this, you should get into real estate. And he told me, I wouldn't wish real estate on my worst enemy and you should be in real estate. And I didn't realize what he meant at that time. <laughs> I did shortly thereafter when I quit my job of, you know, I was making 135,000 bucks a year and just went cold turkey and got into real estate in 2005 had a couple of easy sales and then the market turned and really had to build a business. Um, mm -hmm. We sold our dream house in 2007. I actually, when we closed on that house, we sold it for 525,000. I got a check for, I think it was $1,826 because we were so close to being upside down and being that foreclosure, that short sale route and just wow. saw the writing on the wall and, and, and made that decision. And then built a really healthy, successful business in in real estate. Got into GoBundance, which you know we're both in in 2014, which changed my life and gave me a group of people to aspire to be and get pulled in their wake. I started my team in 2015, and and I have a, an amazing real estate team here in the Central Valley of California for the past well, going on 10 years with them. Wow. So yeah, so you entered into real estate in 2005. I, I think the market crashed in early 2008, right? So, yes. so maybe a great, maybe a great couple of years for you, but, but you kind of got that trial by fire. So was it, it did not a great start for you, was it? Well, real estate is one of the, I believe my mm -hmm. truth is that real estate is one of the last true entrepreneurial places where anybody can go and be successful. You know, I was the reason there is a bell curve mm -hmm. uh, in, in school. So I, I wasn't the smartest, smartest guy in the room. And but but with real estate, it's all front and loaded because you don't have any reputation. You don't have any skills. You don't have any relationships. You don't have any of the things that you need to have a successful business. And all of those things are earned in really your first three or four years of, of getting in the business. Uh, it was, it was a lot of hard work and then the market crashed, which made it even more hard work, but it was the best thing that could have happened because it gave me the skills that I still use today with my team. Yeah. What made you want to stick with it when it, when it crashed, when you, when, you know, you struggled to kind of build it up and, and then it crashes. How'd you I burn the bridges? It? Yeah. I, I, I quit a job and you know, my wife was at home staying home with the kids. I had a two and a half year old and a six month old. And I was just like, there is no other option but success. And I was just gonna outwork and out hustle everybody else until I, I was able to, to, not have my back against the wall. Right. 
So, uh, uh, and you mentioned earlier, uh, you talked to, um, you know, you worked for your, uh, your dad in the family business, uh, for, for, for some time, what, what was the family business and, and, um, and what was your experience like in, in, in that business? Uh, you mentioned being paid last, but I'd love to hear a little more on that. You know, my dad, and he still has it. He had a, a screen printing um, business for T-shirts and that kind of stuff. And he he had niched down where most of the year it was just a regular screen printing business. And then during the summer and fire season here in California, they firefighters come from all over the country to fight these wildfires. And they're gone for 23 days at a time. So we would actually go set up a mobile screen printing shop mm. at the base camps, print a you know, a memento t-shirt basically for these guys. And that's where my dad made probably 75% of his money for the year was during that two or three month period. And for the most part, it was just my dad and I working in the shop for a couple of years when I, when I moved back home. Wow. Yeah. And, and did you, is there any, are there any lessons that you took from that experience that you have applied going forward or, or to today, how you work with your teams? It, it's interesting that you asked that question because one of them I'm I'm going over with my team right now, and that was my dad always listened to tapes, and there was a a tape that we listened to probably 25 or 30 times. It was Roger Dawson's "The Secret of Power Negotiating," mm. and you know all of us nobody thinks they're a salesperson, but everybody's a salesperson, and we negotiate all of the time. And we listened to that to where I could almost quote him as he was going through it. But it has made such a huge difference in my life because people negotiate and they use different tactics or gambits and they don't even realize they're doing it half of the time. And when you understand that, it has made a huge difference in my real estate career. And then now I'm paying that forward and our team is actually listening for the third time through that whole series that and book that he had put together Um so that was one, just the the power of learning from other people when you're you're doing your work. My dad just always had a tape going. Mm-hmm. And then um, you know, I I think the other thing was was my dad's never been a businessman and you know, we grew up poor and he never really had any financial discipline. You know, when you got six kids, there's always a place yeah. for money to go. <laughs> always a place for right. money to go. So I remember months where he would make a lot of money doing during the, the the fire season, and then we would be broke a few months later because they they didn't have that discipline. And and in hindsight, looking back, I think that was when I started my real estate career. One of my mentors said something to me about being a businessman and doing real estate, and that really stuck with me. And I was like, "What does it mean to be a business person?" Yeah. And and had to make that whole transition from being an employee to being a business owner. And but my my dad's example of just the classic um what is the book that talks about entrepreneur? Um the E Myth Revisited. My dad was just the classic solopreneur where he just worked all of the time. And mm-hmm. and so learning from that I think was really helpful when I was building my career of what not to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, growing growing up poor, I, and you hear this story a lot in, in groups like GoBundance. I hear I hear it a lot about people who have grown up poor, and their relationship with money is such that that uh, you know, or they they build a relationship with money. They they transform that that mental uh, scarcity mindset into something of abundance. And it sounds like you went in that direction too. Uh, oh with, yeah, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, you know, it's. Um... So I I might go on a tangent just a little bit on this, but I I think it's really important for people to hear because a lot of people just don't talk about money uh, at at all, which is a problem because money is just a tool, but most of us have a relationship with money. I am a recovering spending alcoholic. So I was the classic spender. I think there's really two profiles. You've got your spender and your saver. Both come from places of fear. A, a saver is afraid of instability. So the money to them is stability. And once it goes into their savings account, they will not, it, it's like an NRA member with like, you can have this dollar when you pry it from my cold dead fingers. <laughs> and and I was the exact opposite of that. You know, I right. thrived in the instability. I was like, I work best with the smell of napalm and my back against the wall. So anytime I had money, I would find a place for it to go because 
the stability was what I was afraid of. I didn't know know what it was. And I, I really went through my whole life until I was, you know, in my 40 or so before I had someone ask me a question that, that triggered a response that, uh, that allowed me to start making those changes. Because, you know, when I was working at the jewelry store, I was as broke the day that I left other than owning my house that I had no equity in, obviously, because I sold it two years later. Um, I was as broke the day that I left making 135,000 as I was the day that I started making 16,000. And I remember I went to a conference and this is, uh, probably 2010, 2011. And one of my mentors was there speaking the the coaching company that I've been, had my business coached by. And I went up to him after the event and I said, Brian, I go, I don't understand why I can't save money. I know how to make it, but I can't save it. And I don't know why. And he looked at me and he said, Aaron, what's your dad's relationship with money? And I was like, I I literally felt like I got punched in the gut because it was the first time in my entire adult life that I came to the realization that I was reliving the train tracks and what was normal to my parents was normal to me. And so I was just locked into those train tracks. Hmm. And, and, you know, we talked for probably five minutes after that. And I don't remember anything that we talked about because that question, I remember turning around, walking away and just being like, holy crap. And I had to make a decision right then of how am I going to stay living in this house that has been built for me by my parents, who was probably built for them by his parents and, you know, up and up? Or was I going to start making changes to allow myself to start building wealth and to become comfortable with money? And and fortunately, I started putting disciplines into place to be able to make that happen to where we, you know, we've built wealth now. Wow. I'm really glad you say that. Is that I, I, I mean, that that resonates with me and, and kind of my growing up when I look at the the messaging that I got you know, from my parents or, or around money, you know, we talk about the family business and there was this attitude like going down into, for us, it was the fourth generation where we didn't want to build entitlement in the next generation. And so the messaging was nobody gets rich off of the company. We just put, put food on the plates. But the challenge was, is as noble as that sounds, it actually imprints, a, it imprinted a scarcity mindset of, oh, it's bad to get you know, wealthier to generate wealth. So we better just make a dollar over what we need and then, you know, be good with it. Um, and that, of course, led to a lot of fear as I was growing up. So I to really relate to what you were saying there, different but similar. It's, uh, it's yeah. but two ends of the spectrum. And, and you know, the, the, what I learned was, and, and this, is, this applies for both savers and spenders. So for all of you listeners, wherever you fall in this spectrum, uh, one of my good friends, Daniel Del Real, says um, ownership sinks stewardship. And what that means is if you were given a million dollars, and I'll just ask this question to you, to you, if you were given a million dollars, like you won the lottery, what would you do with that money? Mm-hmm. If you're a spender, you're probably going to go get a new car, buy some clothes. You say you're going to invest it. Uh, and, but the reality is, is you're going to fall into that predisposition. If you're a saver, you're going to be like, I'm going to buy a house because that's safe. I'm going to put the rest into bonds because those are safe and your life's not going to change at all. That's ownership. Mm -hmm. But if you ask the question and I'll, I'll just give you a scenario of you picture your best friend in the world, Mm -hmm. they come to you and they say, um, Adam, I just found out I have stage four cancer and I have a million dollar life insurance policy and I want you to take care of this money until my son turns 18 in 15 years. Mm -hmm. Would you treat that money differently than the money that you were given by winning the lottery? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. because there's stewardship of that money. You are a right. steward of that money for someone else. Mm-hmm. The way wealthy people build wealth or the way that you change your mindset is that you create stewardship for your money. For me, I, I opened up a savings account that I named not my money. I still have it. It's just a regular savings account, but it was a commitment that I made 
that that money wasn't for me and my lifestyle and my mm. predispositions. That money was for the Aaron that I wanted to be and the wealth that I wanted to have. And then every time I got a paycheck, I would put it into that account, put it into that account, put it in that account. And when there was enough money for to do something with it, I would go invest it. And then I was broke again and I was able to live my life again. And I did that again and again and again. And, and that stewardship of that money is it wasn't my money. So I, I literally just said, it's not my money. If you're a saver, you can do the same thing. You can say, am I comfortable with what I have in savings? If the answer is yes, then I need to create an account that I look at as an investment account. And I'm okay mm -hmm. if I lose it. And a, sa a saver is never going to lose it because they're still going to make secure, safe investments, but at least they will be making investments, which they now have stewardship of the money in that account. Yeah, that's that's really good. So with when uh, so whether we're a saver uh, or or we're a spender, we're in that fear. So both of those sides of the equation. So if you're a saver, it, it, am I interpreting that that's different than an investor, or is that the same? Oh yeah, because savers answer? they put it into a. I mean, if they could put it under their mattress, yeah, they would put it under their mattress. And and once it goes into the, I have a a client that I just met with a few months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, their, their son and daughter actually, and the mom was older. The mom in 2000 sold this big piece of property that they built a school on and she got paid $800,000 for the bare land. Mm -hmm. A few months ago when I sat down with them, guess how much was, how much she had taken that money and turned it into? What, what was that? $800,000. Wow. She put it in a savings account earning 0.04% for 23 years. Wow. If she'd have done nothing but put it into something, that account would be 800, a million, a million, five, two million dollars. But because she was a saver and that $800,000 was the stability that she didn't want to lose for her kids, she just put it into a savings account. And that's how a lot of people who are savers have that mindset of just like, I want stability and the money in my account is stability. So it's a fear thing. Yeah. And, and it's, it's this just two sides of the same coin that the, the, the fix is the same. It's just recognizing it and then making the changes. Yeah. That's such, that's such, I mean, self-awareness is sounds like it's such a, 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 an important tool here is just knowing which side of the spectrum you fall on, how, how to fix that. And it sounds like you had a high level of self-awareness early on to know that you maybe weren't going and didn't need to go into college <laughs> or, but, it, but, but that you had the sales mindset. Am I, am I wrong? Or did, did you have you know, that? I, I don't know that I would call it self-awareness. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think anybody's ever put it that way. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know that I would speak to that and call it that. I, I think that as I've gotten older, the answer is, Yes. Uh, I, I believe that we're all different people every seven yeah. years. You know, our, our whole body is different. Every cell in your body, except for a couple, is different every seven years. And we go through a metamorphosis every seven years. Whether we're aware of it or not, most people aren't. And again, when you surround yourself with really high level self-aware people who are willing to have honest and open conversations, there's a level of self-awareness that's forced upon you. Um, you know, two years ago, I was, uh, we were down at a, at our house in, in Cabo with a couple of sets of friends and it's 10 o'clock at night. And I'm really good at asking questions as a deflection mechanism mm -hmm. and being really good with, you know, I'm, I'm known in abundance as the accountability guy because I'm really good at, at finding holes and then poking holes in there. Yeah. And, and at this particular night, all eyes turned to me and Daniel said, he goes, Aaron, every time we get into a room where, you know, it's a bunch of wealthy people or so you're like, ah, I'm out of, I'm out of my league here, or I'm a little fish in a big pond. And he said, why do you say that? Because you've earned the right to be in those rooms. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Hmm. And then later on, uh, uh, this other friend of ours were talking and she said, Aaron, I just want to know you. And I was like, what does that mean? I just want to know you. You've known me for years. But it led down this whole path of, you know, what did she mean by that? And, and this, this level of self-awareness where 
through counseling and, you know, you know, I, I think there's trauma and a big T and then there's death by a thousand cuts. And I was mm-hmm. more the death by a thousand cuts kind of guy, but it's opened up this self-awareness of, you know, my reality is just my reality. Your reality is your reality. And let's, let's, let's have a conversation about it. Hey everyone, I interrupt this program to introduce you to a powerful tool that will help you gain clarity on your vision and accelerate your growth and achievement. If you're listening to this show, it is likely that you have an exciting vision for your life. But the problem is, is that we often get caught up in the day to day. We get distracted. We face uncertainty, overwhelm, and self doubt. And as a result, the gap between where you are and where you want to be seems insurmountable. And that's why I created a framework for how you can turn your vision into strategic, disciplined action that will accelerate your results in the next 90 days. I call it the Vision Reflection Retreat. It is a two-day solo excursion designed to reignite passion and adventure into your busy life and realign your focus toward your why. This is the very same framework that I use every 90 days to reflect on my own life and my vision and set my goals for the next quarter. And it has been a game changer. And the good news is, is that I'm giving away this Vision Reflection Retreat guidebook for free when you sign up for my newsletter, simply go to flowoverfear.com slash retreat and download your free guide and enjoy the journey. Yeah. I love that. So what, how would you define the Aaron West today then? As far as you, you have this self-awareness, you, you get, you're getting challenged on that. You're known as the accountability guy. What does that look like? I think I'm just way more open to other people's perspectives now. Uh, there's this expression or this this term that I, I try and use all the time now, and it's insane curiosity. Mm. And I used to be the guy that would have a conversation with someone, ask a couple of questions, and then get up on a pulpit and fix their problem because that's just what I did. Yeah. And I've learned that by asking better questions, I can find out, A, do they want help? Because a lot of people just don't. And B, is the problem that I think they have the one that they have? And and then find out what their reality is. I, I'm way more curious now than I than I used to be. And I think with that curiosity comes a a calmness and a you know, I, I was always, you know, I say this about my wife and I I was always an inch wide or an inch deep and a mile wide. Mm-hmm. And people would meet me and they'd be like, Oh, Aaron's a really nice guy. And then they would meet my wife and they would say, We should all hang out. Because she was an inch wide and a mile deep. And I think with the the self-awareness that has happened over the past four or five years, I've become much more calmer and deeper versus ripply and shallow. Yeah. I I, I love the curiosity aspect of it. I mean, that's such a it's it's such a great superpower to have when you can develop it. And and it's something that I know that uh, you know, speaking of curiosity, I know that you've developed that too through abundance. You have there's this there's this uh, uh, part of Go Abundance that that is really, really one of the greatest, most valuable things about it that you co-host with Daniel DeReal called the um, called the Seven to Eight program, uh, and it talks about you know entrepreneurs who've gone from seven figure net worth to eight figures and and beyond, some even nine figures, which is just insane. And um, and yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. And some and of the actually lessons 10 figures. Learned. We've yeah. interviewed a couple of billionaires. So really? we, we, we've had a seven to 10. <laughs> we've had seven to eight, seven to nine. It has been one of the the gifts that, uh, that I've been given to be able to, to host this. And it's not mm-hmm. a podcast. It's actually a show. It's, it's once a month. And for most people, when, when someone achieves success and they go on their podcasts and people are talking, they typically ask about where are they today? What are you investing mm-hmm. in right now? Tell me about the multifamily or whatever it is that, that they're doing. And what we found is the real gold and the real nuggets are in what happened for them to earn the right to have that wealth because nothing mm-hmm. is given, everything is earned. And the lessons, and, and we actually, you know, I, I do a, um, a keynote speech about the lessons that, we, that, that we've learned from taking a step back and looking at the commonalities between pretty much every single one of these entrepreneurs that, that has built wealth. Uh, they all 
in different ways experience the same growth and pain points in their journey to that hockey stick of money actually doing all of the work for you and you having a level of mastery that you now are compensated you know 10 20x of what you were when you first started doing the exact same thing hmm. what are some of the pain points that you're finding within that that journey that that are common the the first is is that they all just made a decision to build, be wealthy. They mm-hmm. all just made a decision that I am going to build wealth. And I think there's a difference between being rich and being wealthy. And for some of them, they started out saying, I want to be rich and that's okay. And then it turned into, I, I want to be wealthy. And most people don't ever make that decision. Uh, mm-hmm. Most people hear you know, they go to, they read a book or they watch TV or they go to a conference or they something, they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And all of these people actually made a black and white decision. I am going to do this and I'm going to do it well. And then the second thing in their journey is that it's always harder than they think it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And that's the place that most people who make that decision stop is because Gary Vaynerchuk says this, he says, people want to get rich quick, but life is long. And for most people, they say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get rich. But then they experience the hardship that you have to go through to earn the right to be wealthy and they just stop. And, Mm -hmm. and so that's, those are the two biggest ones. And then Every single person has failures. We, we all have failures in, in different ways. I know you do Ironmans. I, I used to do Ironmans. We've all had our dark moments where it just all fell apart. Oh, yeah. And, and most of the time, those dark moments are the moments that you draw back on later because you're like, I got through this. And, and so for every single, literally every single one of them have these huge failures in their lives that how they responded to those and how they learned from those or pivot points in their journey of building wealth and building success. Yeah. And then, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, please. Yeah. No. And, and, and then, then the, the other two that just pop into my head right off the b- bat is the one that shortens the curve faster than anything else is relationships. Mm-hmm. Uh, understanding the power of surrounding yourself with people who are, like-minded and farther along the journey than you and that are willing to speak truth into you and willing to give you perspective and that you're willing to learn from is the biggest accelerant of being able to build wealth of, of anything that any of them has done. And then the last is just generosity. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I was on a podcast a couple of days ago and it was with a friend who has built a lot of wealth. He's in, he's in the multiple, you know, eight figure, uh, level. And about four years ago we were sitting down and I was doing my thing and he donated a lot of time, but he didn't donate any money because Mm -hmm. he was like, he was, he was very, um, scarcity mindset still as far as his money was going. So he was like, I'll donate time. And when we challenged him to to come up with a number that hurt for him, which he did, and I asked him, I said, I said, Gabe, what what how how many X has your net worth uh, done since you you changed just that one thing? And he says it's five X. Wow. And yeah. when when I interviewed Richard Branson for the seven to eight show, we were we went to Necker Island. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> but when we finished the interview, they opened it up for questions. And one of the the entrepreneurs stood up and, and he said, he goes, Sir Richard, at what point did generosity and philanthropy come into your, your business or in your world? And Richard said this, and it, it impacted me. And it impacts me more every time I think about it or say, he said, it's always been. He said, when I opened my first record store, the funds from that record store paid for a suicide hotline that we did. And then he said this, he said, nothing in my life has opened more doors or given me more opportunities than generosity and philanthropy. Hmm. And I was like, Oh, that's big. And I think that's something that a lot of people, when they start building wealth, they don't realize how, you know, the energy and the flow and the people you meet, because the people who are generous are usually wealthy people. And I, I mean, it just opens all of these doors. So yeah. those are some of the nuggets from, uh, you know, interviewing 
50, 50 guys that have done gone from seven to eight figures. Yeah. That, that, that generosity piece is so, is so powerful too, because I, I mean, I I've, I've witnessed it and maybe you can put more of a, a quantifier to this, but I've, I've, you know, it, even though it's hard to say like, this is the direct path of why being giving and, and contributing leads to greater wealth. Even though you don't know that there's just this faith element to it that, 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 you know, that like when you are more generous with what you're given, you are given back in return in abundance. And, and, um, and, and yeah, I, I like the way you put it, give, give where it hurts. Like you have to find that pain point. Um, I, I, I like that. I, do you, um, I don't know, maybe, do you have like a quantifiable, uh, uh, rationale as to why that, you know, giving leads to leads to greater wealth or, or leads to at least an abundance on, on that sense? Or what are your thoughts on that? There's a game called cash flow or that Robert Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki has a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad, which I'm sure a lot of people have read. If you haven't, it's a great book, but there's a game that he has called cash flow. And in this game, it's all about winning your own game. So you're given a life, be it an engineer, an airline pilot, a waitress, a teacher, whatever it is with, with a set of bills. And then your job is to get enough cash flow to win your game and, and turn the board over. And, and in this game, there's one slot that if you land on it, it says, give 10% of your income to charity. And I said, no, no, no. And then finally I did it. And, and then you get two dice instead of one dice. So I, I think that there's this, when you're, when you're not charitable, money is water. And when you're not charitable, you're, you're holding up an umbrella over the top of you. And, and all the water's flowing around you. And, and wealthy people understand that water flows and, and money flows in these big circles. So when you give, all you're doing is allowing it to circle back to you. And I don't know if there's any quantifiable of like, if you give X, you're going to give this. But just from uh, talking to so many people and, and then my life, my life as well, how much it has changed because I'm willing to separate from something that was so hard for me to get to help other people. It's that, you know, you give in slices and receive in loaves. I'm mm -hmm. a huge, I, I believe that is just a, it's a law like gravity. I love that. I've never heard that before. Given slices or given, given slices, gain in loaves, loaves. Yep. That's awesome. Given slices, receive in loaves. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, just to be a fly on the wall, uh, to use your words, uh, when you when you intro the the seven to eight calls on those seven to eight calls, I mean, that is worth the price of admission, just to learn from some of the um, some of the most experienced entrepreneurs in the world and successful people, uh, including Sir Richard Branson, which I th that was an amazing interview too. I love that, um, and uh, um, yeah, it, it's it's just been incredible to to watch that and and learn from that. Um, and so, you know, you're living in abundance, not just in the, in the world of, of, you know, generating wealth, but you're also, you know, one of the things I hear about you from mutual acquaintances that we have is that you, you as a leader are really giving, and it's not just in, in the spirit of giving in charitable ways, but lifting people up in the terms of how you build your team. Um, can you speak to that? How you, uh, you know, how you, how you build your teams, how you're, how you're helping them to succeed as well. Well, thank you. First of all, that was very kind of you to say, and, Absolutely. and whoever my friends are that said that you can tell them, I said, thank you as well. <laughs> I, I, again, I, it is, you know, I, I, I use this analogy. It's the barrel of monkeys analogy. And I, th it's when you have conversations with people, when you ask quality questions and you get quality answers, you either find out that you're the monkey that has the hand up and they have the hand down to help you or that they have the hand up and you have the hand down to help them. Mm -hmm. I have been, you know, I, everybody has an ego I have been punched in the mouth so many times that I I've learned to check the ego at the door. And really when you're, when you're building a team or you're working with, with other people, it's 
what are their goals? What's important to them? Because if you're able to help them achieve those goals, you win as well. Mm -hmm. And you do it from a place that it's, again, it's like what we talked about with, with generosity. There's just a law that says when you help other people be successful, you become more successful because of that. And with the team, we always we spend a lot of time at the front end finding out what their goals are, where they want to be in five years, what a win looks like for them. And then we revisit that every so often and say, how can we help you make that happen? And I, I, I heard this once that when you become a leader of people in a business or whatever it is, your job is to, first of all, know what everybody in your world, what they want their world to look like. Mm-hmm. And then you have to build a world that is so big that they can have their world inside of that world. And if they ever grow outside of your world, that's your fault that they leave because you as a leader didn't didn't grow your world big enough to allow them to express and do everything that they want to do in their world. And that's just how I've always looked at the team was my job is to have a world that they can have whatever world it is they want inside of that world. And if I do that, then they stay forever and they're happy and they work through stuff. If I don't do that, then they leave. And it's my fault if they leave because I didn't find out what their world was and then help them build that. I love that. That's, I mean, that's so good. I I think there's a fear and a fear mindset in there too, from a leadership standpoint that we're afraid of losing people. So we might want to lead by an iron fist or, or, or whatever that might be. Um, but almost it's, it's almost like building, building the skills that they have the freedom to leave or go anywhere, but they don't want to because they're getting everything they need right here or right, right with you. And I say that I, I say, I want to make their lives so easy that they're like, why would I leave? I've got it so good here. Why? Why would I leave? It just uh, yes, I could probably go and make some a more a little bit more money somewhere else, but then I would have to do so much more, and and so that's that's just kind of the mindset that we have is how can we continue to provide and continue to provide so that they know that if they leave, they're not getting the same experience wherever they go. Yeah, yeah, and and you're leading by example on that too from. You know, from what I see in GoBundance, you know, you are you. You mentioned yourself; you're the accountability guy. You also help through workshops with uh, with goal setting and you know helping with what we call our one sheet. Uh, you know, building that out and making sure that we're we're doing that. What are some of your big uh, uh, higher level tips on on how we can set goals that stick and stay accountable to them? <laughs> okay, that this is a hard one. I we actually have a, it's a two day class that's mm. sixteen hours to learn how to write goals the correct way, wow. and then I do a one day, and then there's a four day one that I do in usually October, November, or a four hour one that I'll do with Zoom with whoever is interested. But I'll, I'll give you. High level, just the the biggest mistakes that I see people make compared to what really successful people's goal writings are, people who are masters at goal writing. The first is, is that they don't understand that there are different kinds of goals. There are results goals and then there are activity goals. And most people write results goals. Run a marathon is a results goal. Uh, Do an Ironman, be a better husband, be a better dad, lose 10 pounds, sell 30 houses. Those are all the result that you are trying to achieve, the goals are the actual activities that you can do by which to achieve that result. Uh, for example, it's be a better husband. You know, I, I in the GoBundance group, that's something that we talk about a lot because we're all trying to lead big whole lives. And they'll write down, be a better husband. And I'll say, well, what does that mean? And they'll be like, well, I need to show up better. And I'll, well, what does that mean? And then you start out, you keep asking that questions until you get, well, 36 date night. Well, I want to go on a date night with my wife every week. Okay. Is that realistic? No. Well, then what does 36 date nights in the year look like? Now that's a goal that your brain can take a hold of. Uh, is it read three books with your wife through the year? Is it attend one marriage conference with the year? Is it, um, going on four overnights with your wife a year or whatever that number looks like. But you should be able to look at your goals and say, if I achieve these goals, 
am I going to be a better husband for my wife? And if the answer is no, then you go, okay, what else do I need to do? If I, if my wife read these goals, would she go, yes, you're going to show up as a better husband. And if the answer is no, then you need to go back and revisit those. The result is you're a better husband. The actual goals are the trackable things that you can do. So if you look at my goal set of goals, virtually every single one of them has a number attached to it. You know, for my health, one of my goals is to get down to 12% body fat. That's a result that I'm trying to get down to. So for me to say I can do that, I have 180 weight sessions. I have 180 uh, yoga sessions or stretching sessions. I've got cold plunge 150 times. I've got sauna 150 times. It's tracking my my macros 300 times. It's uh, drinking a gallon of water 250 times. All of those things, if I do all of those things, I can get to 12% body fat. If I don't, then I, then I know something has to change if I've actually been achieving those. So that's, the, that's probably the biggest mistake. They should all be complete sentences. They should all have a number attached typically at the front end of it. So 24 date nights is a complete sentence. Um, the other one that I see a lot of people make is that in, when they're writing their yearly goals, they're actually writing monthly, weekly, or daily goals. Uh, they'll say in their yearly goals, they'll put read the Bible daily. And first of all, your brain looks at your goals and says, is this realistic? And when you put read the Bible daily, your brain says, that's not going to happen. Because you're going to get sick. You're going to leave your Bible at the, the you know, at home when you go on vacation. A, a good goal for that is read the Bible 300 times. You can miss two months and still achieve that goal. So your brain says, okay, that's achievable and that's workable. Or date night once a week with my wife. I see that's one we see all of the time. And you're never going to make that's that's not an achievable goal because something is good. She's going to get sick on Wednesday night and you're not going to go and you're going to miss. So, so it's writing achievable goals with a number attached to them that are yearly goals. And then you break those down to quarter weekly and, you know, quarter weekly daily uh, goals. I really love that. I love And I love the the curiosity that you bring to it, too, with with the question of will this lead to the result I'm looking for of being a better husband or um, being more spiritual or what have you. I, I like that aspect of it because I found even myself, like I'll set those goals of like, yeah, I want to play music like 200 times this year, but like, but, but to what end? Like, is this going to help me to be more creative? Yes, it is. As long as I do it this way or what have you. I feel like that defines a, a more, a, a clearer goal. I, I love that part of it. And, and there's a, I think it's a quote. I, I heard this and, Goals are the ability to predict the future. Mm -hmm. and, and when you become good at writing goals, the future becomes an inevitability in whatever, whatever area that is if you achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, there, there's so much science behind how you write goals, where they go in your brain, um, you know, how do you keep them in front of you, and then really just spending the time to be able to tell your brain that this is important. Most people, and so Adam, how long do you spend writing your goals every year? Oh, Like your yearly goals. Just give me a number. 12 I, hours, five hours, 10 hours? I usually, I usually spend a full day on that. So I'd say eight okay. hours. Yeah, Eight hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night and remembered to do something? Oh, yes. All the yeah, time. All, like every all night. Of us yeah. <laughs> you know why? Because your brain never turns off. Your right. brain is, your, your non-conscious mind is always working for you and trying to solve the problem of how do I fix X? When you spend eight hours, you are actually spending, because there's 8,760 hours in a year, you're actually spending 0.0004% of the year telling your brain what you are trying to achieve. So if you're not super intentional and super clear about what you're telling your brain to achieve, people wonder why they don't achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. And that's where spending the time and then learning how to write those goals correctly make a huge difference in what you are able to accomplish in your life. Yeah. So knowing, so knowing that you 
uh, should be intentional about writing your goals you, and you uh, and your brain's always on. Is there a mechanism that you use or some kind of habit that you use to track those ideas that you have that may eventually turn into the goals for the year? Well, I'll typically spend anywhere from two to four days on the, the first set of, of goals that I do. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. go through and write all of my goals and then I will come back a couple of weeks later, go through the exact same process again because I'll be in a different mindset. Mm-hmm. I typically write 10 goals in each area of my life, each of the the gardens, friends, family, um, relationships, bucket list, you know, what adventure travel, all, the same ones that we use for, for the one sheet. I'll write 10 mm-hmm. in each one of those. Then I'll come back and write another 10, you know, later. Then I'll compare the two and say, which ones of these resonate the best with me? And then I'll transfer those to a sheet of 10. Then from that sheet of 10, I'll transfer it to my yearly goals, which I only write three big rocks in each area of my life to where I can say, okay, if I accomplish these three things in each one of these areas of my life for the year, it is a successful year. Mm -hmm. Now, because I spend so much time and I'm intentional and understand how to write goals, so many of those other, you know, 70 or 100 goals that I write end up happening on, on accident. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, on accident, I put that in quotation marks because your brain is now looking for how do I make that happen? And so what you normally would be just having a conversation with, with you and I, all of a sudden someone says something over here and your brain's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said something. And your head swivels over and an opportunity or a conversation or something that pertains to those goals happen. I can't tell you how many times that happens. It's uncanny. (laughs) That's crazy. So goals, uh, you know, are, are a big part of it, obviously. Writing out the right goals, having them very specific. The other piece of it is the accountability piece. So what, what are your suggestions on, on staying accountable? Obviously, community helps if you're in a community like a GoBundance or, or, or a pod. But what, what, what are the key elements of accountability that, that you would recommend? Just being willing to share them. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll, I'll share my goals with anybody who is willing to listen because that adds another layer of I'm committing to do this and I'm telling you I'm willing to do this. Uh, when you are writing goals or you want to do a goal writing session, Get a bunch of friends together and be like, hey, we're going to do, I'm going to do an afternoon writing goals. Who wants to show up? The people that want to show up are the people that you want to share those with because they want to achieve their goals as well. And, and then you have the opportunity to hear what their goals are. And, and invariably some of their goals, you go, oh, I'd really like to do that too. And you get more goals added to you. One of the reasons why I teach the goal writing class is so that I can hear everybody else's goals because <laughs> every single year I have ones that, that add to me. I, you know, I had a, com- I have a commitment that every year I have to do one, one goal that scares me. Mm-hmm. And this year it's doing two one hour interviews with my father. So oh, my wow. father and I, I grew up very religious. I left the religion at 25 and, you know, never really, it, it was estranged for a while, a long time, cordial, but there was never really like, and, and we've reconnected now that I've gotten past my, my daddy issues and my damage and, you know, sitting down with my dad for an hour and asking him questions about his life scares the crap out of me. Mm-hmm. But that's one of the commitments that I make when I write goals every year is I have to have at least one goal that scares me. Wow. I, I, that's, that's incredible. Um, and so with, what, do you have any intention around that interview with your dad as far as, are you looking to learn more about, uh, his legacy or, or, or what his dreams were? What, what, what are you hoping to get out of that? You know, I, I will have a list of questions and then it will go just like this where it'll just kind of free flow of him saying something, hopefully that I haven't heard and then going a, a little bit deep diving into that. And and it's interesting too, because when you share your goals, people want to help you make that happen. Out of the blue, two days ago, a guy that I shared my goals with six months ago, I mean, literally January, February, something like that. He, he sent me a text and he's a, he's a YouTuber. He's got a million followers. And he said, Hey, Aaron, I was thinking, look, I might get emotional just thinking, saying this. He said, 
I was thinking about you and your dad. He goes, maybe I can help. He said, I'd be happy to um, set up something to where you can tell your dad that one of your friends who has a podcast or a YouTube channel is doing this thing with a bunch of his friends of people interviewing their parents. And I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. But I, I mentioned to him once, just like us having this conversation. And six months later, he reaches out to me out of the blue. I still haven't done the interview with my dad. And he's like, hey, you said you were going to do this. Let me help you do that. And that's what happens when you share your goals with people. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and I, 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 I found that in my time in GoBundance too, of just being around other people and sharing those goals, exactly what you're saying too. Like you do learn a lot. I mean, I picked up a lot of different goals that I never knew that I wanted to climb Mount, uh, or, or do an Everesting, uh, however many times you're doing it. Is it <laughs> but like, it's like, maybe I do want to do a 29 Oh 29. <laughs> <laughs> or or do rim to rim to rim or whatever it might be, but that's uh that's crazy. So that's on that's on your bucket list. That's something you're doing this year too. Again for the second time is is uh, yes. is doing that Everest challenge. So the Everest uh, challenge of twenty yeah. two nine oh two nine twenty nine twenty nine, which so, is the height of Everest. Okay, so that's like and and are you do is that in Utah? Is that where you're doing it or it's in it? Utah? And and what it is is I'm not climbing Everest, but right. you go to a ski resort and. You hike up the mountain and then take the the gondola down. And with this particular one that I'm doing, it's 30 miles of hiking and 29,000 feet of vertical. Oof. So for every mile, you're gaining 1,000 feet uh, of vertical. And you do it 13 times, I think, is what it is. So you hike up, ride the gondola down. You've got 36 hours to climb 29,000 feet of vertical. Wow, that's a uh, that's incredible, um, and it's uh, in, it could be argued it's incredibly insane. But uh, is, <laughs> for those of you who know, you know, stupid, <laughs> it's stupid. Let's let's real talk this, man. What? Right. Who who does that? I mean, why? <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll be stupid until maybe a week after when you're getting recovered, and then I'll and be like, like, God, that would be fun. That's awesome. It's, right. it's like having a baby. You do an endurance <laughs> event, and like two weeks later, you're like, Man, that would be fun. During while you're doing it, you're like, This is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. Absolutely. And then two weeks later, you have baby amnesia, and you're going, Yeah, I, I'll do that again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Although this well, will be fun because my wife is actually going to be doing it with me. So we're going to do the event together, which will be oh, really cool. Oh, good. Well, yeah. So offline, we were talking about, you know, how during endurance events, you got to a point where your wife would hate you for training that much. <laughs> so now at least you can mutually hate each other doing that process. Now she's a partner in the crime. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing she can say to be upset with me because she's doing the same thing. That's right. <laughs> Well, aside from all of these, this uh, everything that you're doing, all of this, uh, this uh, um, living into an abundant life, what what else are you excited about right now? What what are you really excited about? You know, I am excited about as you start going through like a true personal growth journey, and you start figuring out all the things that have prevented you from becoming the person that you are, and you realize how much more potential that you have. I'm really just excited to, to see what the next five years look like for me. I, I, I think that I'm so different than I was five years ago. And if I keep the intentionality that I have, I'm really excited to meet the guy you know, five years from now that, that I'm going to be. So my wife and I are, do, you know, our relationship is doing really well because of the work that we've, we've been doing. And my boys are out of the house and we're in that whole phase of, of no kids in the house. And I'm just excited to see what the business does. I've got a bunch of new team members that are absolute young rock stars. And I'm super excited to see what their lives look like in five years with mentorship and skills and uh yeah it's it's an exciting it's an exciting time that's exciting that's that's amazing so you and i hear the the term five five years a lot is that really the time frame in the future where you look forward and you you kind of have this vision for what life looks like at that point i do actually and that's yeah i i have a cup i've done a couple of five year visions that have come through almost we were talking about this offline that have come yeah. through almost verbatim to what was written down five years before and you know, people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in five. Mm -hmm. 
And, and five years from now, it's, you know, I'm not afraid of making mistakes anymore. Failure is something I, I think that, you know, you, you flow over fear it, it is the podcast. We all have fear and I'm learning to address that fear better uh, and recognize it and then take the steps to step through it. Because typically that fear prevents you from doing so many things that when you turn around after addressing it, you go, oh, why didn't I do that a long time ago? And yeah. and like anybody, I'm still working through a lot of fear that I have that prevents me from doing some bigger things and some uh, opportunities. But it's, um, you know, becoming more self-aware and just recognizing when it's fear instead of just brushing it under the, under the, under the, the carpet, I think is what gives me excitement about what, what the future has to hold. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a great, great place to tie a bow on this because yeah, that, that idea of, of being aware of the fear at least and, and knowing it's there, being able to name it gives you that opportunity to actually start to move through it and, and find the other side and, and find fulfillment. Aaron, this has been a real pleasure. I've been, it's, it's been exciting. It has been, you, you just said it yourself. Like, why didn't this happen earlier? And uh, <laughs> that's what I'm wondering is why I haven't chatted with you earlier. So I'm, I'm glad we have the chance to now. Um, I am as well. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for being here. And, uh, and I understand, uh, you may be uh, on occasion, you plan uh, goal setting master classes and, and, and things like that. If people want to get in touch with you to, to find out about that, is, is there any way you'd like to point them to find out about that? You know, the, probably the easiest way is just to find me on Instagram, the Aaron C. West. And if you just shoot me a DM, I'll have the team get your address, your email address, and then let you know when we're getting ready to do it. And it is really, really powerful and has helped a lot of people just get clarity and figure out where, where, where they're not aware of the places that they need to be. And uh, so, yeah, just, just reach out to me through Instagram. I'm happy to help. I've had so many people that have poured themselves into me. It's like an obligation to give back. Awesome. Aaron, thank you so, so much. That's amazing. Uh, if, uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, everybody, thank you so much. Please uh, rate, subscribe it, and, uh, and follow Aaron on Instagram. Um, he's got some great content. And, um, and yeah, this has been a real pleasure, Aaron. Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody else out there, thank you so much for being here. We will see you next time. Thank you so much for joining me today on Flow Over Fear. If you are liking this show, please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. That way you'll be first to know when I drop a new episode, including interviews or trainings or dad jokes. That's right, dad jokes. Add a little levity to your life. And if you liked this episode in particular and you think somebody can get something from it, please share it with a friend. And that way we'll spread the message together. Thanks again for joining me today. We'll see you next time.